Astro Team Hugh, and you're listening to the Agile Uprising podcast. Greetings, and welcome to another edition of the Agile Uprising Podcast. I'm this episode's host, Jay Hersko, and the topic of today's conversation is combining the business and IT. So as all of us go through our transformations, we always know that we, we hit upon that sticking point where getting the two pieces to merge together can sometimes be a little bit difficult. So um, joining us is Georgina Hughes from across the pond in the UK, actually technically uh, in the future. Um, And Georgie actually has a background in psychology, and if you remember, we had her on the Future of Agile podcast, so I wanted to invite her back to further unpack this conversation about ways that we can get the business and IT to work better together. So Georgie, thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me again. And for those that maybe didn't hear the first message, uh, didn't hear the first episode, or may, may not be familiar with you, can you give us a brief intro? Sure. Uh, So my name is Georgina Hughes. Uh, Like you said, I'm based in the UK. I'm living in London. I work as a freelance agile coach. Uh, I've had quite an interesting journey into becoming an agile coach. Uh, So when I was a kid, I thought maybe I wanted to be a journalist, maybe I wanted to be a politician. And uh, so I I did... um, more arts-based subjects at, at my A-levels, so like communication studies, psychology, English, these kinds of things. Uh, I went to uni uh, around the time of the dot boom, uh, dot com boom and crash, and I was like, oh, maybe tech would be a good industry to be in, considering it's just collapsing around me. <laughs> well, it's a, a get into the ground floor, really, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, my dad had been a telephony engineer, so I always had computers and technology around me as I was growing up. And I wasn't really enjoying my, my subject that I'd chosen. So uh, after about a year, I decided to move to computer science. Uh, I needed a degree, and I thought that would be a degree I could do. So <laughs> off I went to do it. Uh, I completed it and went out into industry. Um, pretty naturally, it felt like I should be a programmer. Uh, I specialized in front end because I could pull in all those psychology and comm stuff. And on the side, I was uh, doing a lot of voluntary work for a political party here in the UK. And uh, I helped um, my local branch of this organization go through a really turbulent time. There had been some conflicts in the org and it was all collapsing. Volunteers didn't want to help anymore because of this conflict that was going on. And I spent a couple of years with them and I I helped them deal with this conflict and move the party away from it so that other people started joining and we got some momentum going in that. And it was around the same time that I learned about Agile in my professional career. And I met scrum masters and coaches and I was like, all this stuff I'm doing in the politics that I really enjoy, I could do in the technology, which would still keep me with the technology people, but I don't really want to be a developer. So I I pushed quite hard and I I studied and I went on training courses. (laughs) And uh, a few years later, here I am, Agile Coach. That is that is a wild journey. So the so the psycho the psychology piece, um, yeah. you actually sidled. You were in technology, you came out of technology, and then you sidled back into it, noticing that what I know about how people work and how to get yeah. people to resolve conflict was almost a natural fit to the the uh, like you said the agile coaching right the the most of the work we do is not really training. It's really just getting pieces that don't necessarily fit to fit together. Sure, it's always a people problem. Um, just out of morbid curiosity, you said your dad was a telephony engineer. Are uh, we were talking like old PBX type stuff or like IVRs, like the old like network engineering, like making the piece phones talk to one another? Oh, we're, we're talking really old school. My, my dad was actually quite elderly when he had me. And uh, so he was in um, what was called the GPO over here, which was the um, post office. Okay. which owned the telephony part before it became privatized in the UK. 
So he was doing that in the mid 1900s, so Second War, World War, and, and just oh, after wow. that kind of period. Yeah. Wow. So that's so, like that's old wow. school technology, right? Like that's running wire and you know actual physical boxes and geez, that's yeah. A, that's a that's yeah. a story to be told, right? Um, so and, George, and the the irony about it here actually is that my my partner, who I've been with for over a decade, is also a telephony engineer. Oh. So <laughs> IP telephony and all the rest. Life has come full circle, has it not? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, so about the about the split, right? So you talked about when you were doing some some political work where you noticed that it was getting two people to work with one another, mm. one another to maybe naturally diamet not even diametrically opposed, but it's two different sides. We yeah. see the same thing in our IT lives, and where does I mean I have some ideas, but where does that that almost false bifurcation come from where we have the business and we have IT. Where do you think the genesis of those, I don't even think they view each other as the right hand and the left time. Sometimes it's almost um, almost uh, caustic, if not combative. So where does that come from? Oh, that, well, that's a great question. I, I'm not... I've not been working in organizations for very long. I'm, I'm only in my mid thirties. So I, I've not seen many organizations for long periods of time, but having spoken to consultants who have been doing uh, IT work for much longer than I have, family, friends, and other people that I've met, I, I think there was this paradigm that was brought in in the nineties that, you needed to look at IT as its own cost center and they just needed to be given big documents and they would then go off and do them and then bring back a product to people. And I think over the decade, the people who have been more traditionally in what we typically call the business side of the world, they've come to expect that you throw something at IT and then uh, maybe a year later they deliver something that they didn't want that's not really going to help them and causes them all this frustration. So organizational memory now has this, all of this history that shows that IT are a problem. They are people who just go away. They don't deliver what you need and even if you get involved with them, they're not going to be of any use to you. If I had a dollar for every time I've heard that from someone who is not from the business, right? Because I'm still, I'm subconsciously creating a divide. But if I had a dollar for every time I've heard that almost verbatim, we give you guys what we want. They never say what we think we want. It's what well, we yeah. give you what we want. You go off, you cost us money, you come back. And what we get is not necessarily what we want. And yeah. I, I do. I think you're you're spot on. That happens all the time, and that's it, it's bad. It's setting bad expectations. It's um, it's it's the timeline, right? It's the lack of communication. I, I think your first remark where you said IT is its own cost center. I, I've lost track of how many times I've run into problems, and I'm sure you see it too. Where when you start asking the five whys and getting back to where you think it's coming from, it always yeah. ends up with finance and budgeting. Where does the budget come from? Who's paying for this? It's sort of this funny. It's this really weird argument we should never be having. Um, I did. I, I, I was going to link it to you, but I forgot to throw it into the show notes. There was an article I saw. Um, I think it was by ThoughtWorks, and it talked about the fifth industrial revolution. And they mm -hmm. talked about how in, in way back when, when big corporations started, there was the business as one bucket, say your left hand, and then there was IT, which was the right hand. And it was looked at as totally separate departments. And as we've entered the age of technology, right, the age of Facebook and Google and, you know, Insta mm -hmm. Google tweet paste, um, those two things have started to merge to the point where it's not one or the other, but you're right. There's that, um, I think the term you use is organizational memory. You know, I yeah. remember that, um, I came, I went to Georgie and gave her my requirements, which we know is a bad term. And she came back a year later after spending the entire budget and I got maybe 10% of what I want. And yeah. I, I think it's that old, old habits, old dog, new tricks, I guess, yeah, if I really take your analogy, I think that really does um, create a problem. Now, let me ask you this a little bit off topic. Do you think a startup, or a, a Silicon Valley-esque startup? Do you think they have it easier to break down that wall or maybe not even see the divide between what we would typically call a business piece or an IT piece? Hmm. I, I think it depends on how many people they get together to begin with and what the background of those people are. Um, 
any new system of people has sections of other systems integrated into it because each one of those people brings all the baggage that they've experienced in previous lives. So I think if you've got uh, like a, a group of students or people fresh out of uni and they're working together, you'll, you'll find they do this collaboration thing really naturally. They, they don't really think about it. But over time, as different people get brought in and that culture inevitably gets diluted, that's when you start to see that divide happen. And it, it can even be that those original founders, as they essentially explode out and become the top level of the hierarchy, that can really cause trouble because now they're, they're in competition with the people that they used to be in collaboration with. I don't think that we give enough credence to management skills and coaching skills and teaching people how to be leaders. The majority of managers that I've met in my career have actually been people who were really fabulously good at what they did in their technical realm, be that business analyst or QA or developer or, or you know, any other person who's doing real delivery work. And they, their reward is in a hierarchical world, promotion out of what they're good at. And there's just not enough support and training and explanation to them of how different it, it will be. But in a capitalist society, those people need to be making more money. And most organizations say the, the way to make most money is to move up the management chain. So I think there's some kind of paradigm there that needs to change. You, you know, you brought up a couple things. So the idea of the new hires, right, the young blood coming in, they almost, they almost unfortunately learn how to make that false divide in their heads, like you said, based upon what they're seeing from their leadership. Um, your second point, we could do an entire episode of that itself. <laughs> uh, the, the whole, you know, there's that idea of the Peter principle where everyone rises to the level of their own incompetence. And yeah. Well, that may be true, but sometimes, you know, if I'm good at job A, you move me to job B. And I'm okay at job B, so you move me to job C, and then I'm a failure, right? Well, maybe yeah. job C was never right for me to begin with. And, I, and again, I'm sure we both know plenty of people who were very, very good software engineers, great testers, maybe great scrum masters or project managers. And because they, there's not a um, principal or engineering track, they accelerate up the managerial track. And then you get someone who went to school who loves to write code, learned how to write code, managing 15 people, having to deal with problem employees and all the layoffs yeah. and all the fun stuff that we hate as managers. So I think that's a whole, that's a whole different discussion. Um, so there's a, there's a common remark I've come across while we're talking about the, that false divide that's created culturally. Um, there's, there was a famous story that came out. Um, it was a large major American bank. I, I don't know if I can name them, so I'm not going to name them. Uh, yeah. The CEO got up at an all colleague town hall and his remark was, Everyone looks as, at us as we're, a, um, we're a, a financial services company with a technology department. When that is not at all true, we are a technology company that does financial services. Now, for those of us that I guess are young enough, although I don't consider myself young at all, um, we, get where that, we get where that message goes, right? Because it's telling us that technology is the future and we know that you know, it's going to be in how you, um, how you, that's how you differentiate yourself from your competitors, that's how you innovate. However, do you think, uh, you know, knowing what you know about psychology, do you think that message also has the unintended side effect of, say, say a, big, um, a big stoic institution like banking, like insurance, um, most massive type companies, for all the IT people that get that message and see where we're going, don't you think, is it possible that maybe you're, you're kind of sort of poisoned the well for the older employees who have been in the business side a long time, who now are being told that, hey, you're great at finance and you do awesome work, but now we're a technology company. Do you think maybe that creates more, more harm than good? Maybe we shouldn't say that sort of thing? Whew, um, I, I think probably it does. I, I, I'm currently working in a big investment bank um, and, and actually what I'm seeing with their push to Agile is more that they think it's all about the processes and the metrics uh, and, and doing all of that stuff. 
for what they don't realize is that really to be agile you've got to focus more on the people it's 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 the best value in the manifesto right this is hard <laughs> stuff just read the manifesto it's right there at the top people not processes and oh it, it's it's really hard to watch because these guys have been there 20 30 years their entire career has been spent in this institution what they know winning looks like is what they're encouraging the next generation to behave like and none of these behaviors are anywhere close to gonna get you to be adopting agile um one of the managers that i'm working with at the moment he's a really great technologist and he's learned so much about banking and he can talk very eloquently on both subjects i wouldn't say that he's finance or IT, he, he's financial IT. So he's one of those mythical, what are they, the, the comb-shaped people, right, who has breadth, breadth and depth, right? They grow, they're purple squirrels, they don't grow on trees, right, right? <laughs> purple squirrels, I've never heard that. Term. Yeah, purple, I had a recruiter say that to me when I was looking for a, I, funnily enough, back to telephony, I was looking for a, a telephony developer that knew um, all the API languages uh, like JTappy, TSappy, all the stuff to integrate with like a call manager. And the recruiter told me, she said, Jay, you're looking for a purple squirrel. And I said, I don't get that reference. And she said, well, how often do you see a purple squirrel outside? I said, well, I don't. She goes, yeah, exactly. And I was like, ah, now I get it. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> um, sorry, I've lost my child. Of yeah, no, I, I derailed you. Back to your story. You, you came across someone who was truly comb-shaped, who is, uh, understands both the business and IT. Yeah, yeah, but the behaviors this manager is, is showing are are incredible, you know, it, it's very much, I'm going to tell you what to do, I'm going to think about the problem and then tell you the solution. And uh, I, I just, I, I've given him feedback at times, and the way he can shift his behavior just amazes me. He can change a, a behavior from something that was toxic to something that's not overnight. And I, I wonder what the underlying psychology is that's going on there. I, I wonder how that behavioral change can be made so quickly and whether or not it's a sustainable behavioral change. And I think you probably see the same thing when we're talking about these big institutions as a whole. So, um, you know, they're saying we're going to go agile, we're, we're going to focus more on IT and less on the finance or whatever their, their core business is. I wonder if that's just we, the organization reacting to the world and whether or not that can be a lasting change mm. or, or, or if it's something that, that's a lot of them, you know, a lot of employees who have been around in any organization for a long time think that agile is just the current flash in the pan. And I wonder if it actually will be for some of these big organizations. Mm -hmm. I had, a, I had a network engineer um, or a manager. He was a manager of people in, uh, in my current organization say, Oh, this is just a flash in the pan. We'll be back to waterfall. And, and be funnily enough. So I'm in the, I'm, in, I'm part of the team that's actually helping to steward the transformation. And the first thing I asked her in the interview is, what is the plan for this? You know, is it a fit for purpose and then we move on? And the, the hiring manager said to me, Jay, we have landed in the new world and we have burned the boats. We're not going back. And for me, that was, you sold me in that remark alone because I know that, you know, like you said, there's always, in the, it's a human thing. In the back of our minds, we're always wondering, you know, how, how married should I get to this idea? Is it just going to go backwards? And that to me was a very powerful statement because it said, okay, they're, they're in it to win it. So we're going to, you know, take our lumps and, and just keep going. And you're, uh, that's, a, that's a very, very, um, it's a very strong message that I took. So, well, let's use, let's use your current um, engagement and my current engagement. We'll go back and forth as an example. So, um, sure. and, I, and I'll start with, so how, do we, how are we melting the business in IT? What's, what hints do we have? And, and so I'll throw up my example. Um, from the start, the transformation was not pitched as an IT thing. It was pitched mm -hmm. as a business thing. And, uh, a business, I don't mean business, sorry. It was pitched as an organizational change. And the remark was made, and, and obviously the, the, the message starts in the IT trenches, right? And like the lower, where all the Morlocks are, right? Down there, we started hearing that we're doing this. And then it, it, was, it, ra it re raised a fever pitch, raised to a fever pitch to the point where 
it was starting to be repeated at town halls. Our CEO actually said something where he said, look, this is, this is how we're going. This is the new way we're going to work. And that, like she said, so the people who are kind of on the fence and some of them have nudged, some people are obviously intractable and they still think it's not going to work. But the idea of sucking the business in has sort of taken root where I, I, now you're seeing more and more of, okay, who have we talked to from the business? Who actually speaks to this end customer? Can we get that customer on the phone? Can we get that customer in the room? And slowly, you know, it's not, not, uh, it's not a fast moving stone at all. We've started to pull that into where the business actually gets a sense that they're involved. It's not, it's not something my remark was, it's not something we're doing for them. And it's not something we're doing to them. It's something we're doing with them. And we need to keep that in mind. And we've had some, we've had some successes and some failures, but I'm curious to see what are, what are you seeing? Because you're from, you're, again, you're in a large organization, you know, yeah. finance, it's a very big, how is it going in that regard? Like what, what are your, what do you see? Uh, so I, I see good and I see bad. So some teams are managing to get POs who are actually in the business, who are going to be their end users but they can only get maybe an hour or two of the guy's time and it's actually in the evening because he can't do it during his day job because of uh, the interconnectedness with the wider world of his job. So he just can't not be in his day job during the day. And for what they're building and for the needs they have, that couple of hours once or twice a week is suiting them just fine. I'd be more interested in finding out about their product backlog and seeing if they are actually delivering what the guy thinks. Right, right. But the message I'm getting is that they're doing great with that. The teams that I'm working with, um, they have struggled to get that product owner involvement. So they've had backlogs that are just written by developers and are just a line and it's essentially uh, a checkbox. Uh, <laughs> a tick box exercise, you know, where they're, they're just saying, we need a JIRA code so we can check in our code to that JIRA so we'll write a JIRA. Back to finance, here we go, billing codes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But that's not, that's not agile, that's not even helpful to the developers, that's them just working around a process, back to the people and processes thing. Right? Um, we we have managed to get quite a lot of business time, people coming over, doing story mapping sessions with us. And the, the IT teams I'm working with have learned loads, so much from these business people coming over. But they're not working in greenfield projects. They're working in brownfield projects. The, the software is a decade old. It's got a decade worth of technical debt because for the last however many years, people have been scared of saying, this is a bug, we've got this problem in the system, we need to do some maintenance because the, the message has always had to be positive and shiny and we're going to deliver something for you, aren't we? Great. Which I suppose comes from what we originally were talking about, how you, you always perceive IT to be bad. Well, if you're the IT department and your perception is always bad, you go to a place where you're trying to people please. So they're always throwing out this positive message. And after so many years, you're, you're going to have a product that's falling apart at the seams. Right. And that's exactly what they've got. So our business has been involved. Our IT guys have learned so much, quite frankly, so much that it's scary. They've been building software for these guys in 10 years. And right. And didn't, yeah. By now. And the guys from the business are saying, well, Agile is meant to deliver us something every couple of weeks. We're meant to be able to see all the good stuff you guys are doing. Well, we've not been able to get a test environment for three months. So trying to show you every two weeks what we're delivering is, is just not even a reality that we can ever achieve. Until someone is brave enough to say, no, we need to scrap all this, this architecture, this environmental system, the structure of the department, none of these things are going to allow us to be agile, then the business isn't going to get that quick feedback loop. And of course, as we're, we're taking lots from the business, but not giving them anything in return, the business are now starting to slow down and say, sorry, we don't have any time, we're too busy. Mm. Uh, what you hear in the organization is actually, they're not too busy, 
they're just doing the same as we've been doing to them, which is nodding and smiling, going yes, yes, yes. It sounded like there was there was a moment when when you had when you said you quoted some of the businesses who said, "Hey, look, this is all about us delivering quicker and working together, right?" So it sounds yeah. like it was almost a, it sounds like you, that might have been an example of a lost opportunity where the business was getting it. I'm doing gratuitous air quotes. The business was getting it, and they were understanding what we're trying to do and the way we're working, but due to our own almost not shortcomings, but due to, due to, I'm sure it's legacy decision-making. It's yeah. managerial like fear, right? Nobody wanting to say, I need a whole new environment of AS 400. It's going to cost us $11 billion. We need to do it. Right. Um, <laughs> it sounds to me like that was almost, and we've all seen it, right? It's one of those things where you want to, you want to just smash your head against the table because it's, here was a moment where it could have went a different way and it went the way we didn't want it to. Um, yeah. So in your, but in your current engagement, Georgia, where you've been seeing now, what are some of the, the, how did you get the business to, to buy in? Like, how did you get them to start seeing them as, hey, I have a I have an earned seat at the table. I'm not just here giving you funding and giving you requirements. I'm 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 uh, I'm uh, what's the the pigs versus chickens jokes? I'm not I'm just invested. I'm committed. Yeah. Um. I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um. You know. I I I think this organization. Um. I is different from any other transformation that I've seen. Uh, it's both bottom up and top down. And the way they must hire really impresses me because everyone is very, very smart. I've never been around a group of people who get concepts so quickly. They, they hear a message from management, they go out and research it. I've come in, I say, okay, well, this is a bit that you won't have heard about just from a few Google searches have a look at these things uh, and by the time I finished even a paragraph of talking about a topic they're like got it and they're moving on so they're all really invested because they know their management's invested and everything but we're we're starting to lose even the management part of it and I think mm. we're maybe I was just in so early that I saw something that I've not seen in other organizations but I think we're going to hit that permafrost sooner or later you know that frozen middle the managers yeah. who yep. who they've heard the good stuff but all they've seen is the bad stuff actually this is something that i i think agile is really interesting um because i've been in in an organization before many years ago uh, and i came in it was one of my very first transformations that i ever worked in and uh, the, the managers were just like you keep bringing us problems where have all these problems come from and over the weeks and months they made the decision that agile is what caused all these problems if they just go back to how it was there won't be any problems of course because they've never heard of any of the problems because there was no feedback loop. right and, right and of course they've gone well agile has come in at the same time as we've got more problems so it must be agile so I, I, I think I'm at this position and this moment of time in this organization where everyone is really excited and moving because everybody's doing it. Right. And now that they're starting to see the realities and they're starting to find out what the problems are, I think now is when we're going to start to see that resistance and the, the business will move away and then will be the time that we'll have the interesting questions of how do you get the business to come to the table after they've not seen what they were promised before. Right, after you've burned them once. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, we've, uh, you just had me thinking, we were talking about the business burning the table. Um, I, one, of the most, one of the most powerful things I've seen in my career. Um, so before I go to that, your point of, um, it's it, agile doesn't fix uh, one of the one of the earliest agile coaches I've ever worked with said to me, and I know the quote rattles around in my head. Agile doesn't fix your problems. What it does is it amplifies them and brings them out for everyone to see. So yeah. because you're doing more to your point, more communication, the things that were always bubbling below the surface that everybody just ignored because they knew it was too big of a of a it was too big of a of a uh, uh, take your finger out of the dam and the dam will explode. Mm -hmm. You have dams exploding everywhere. So you find, I find that funny that you're telling me, oh, well, it was, it was, it was agile. We got to go back to waterfall and it'll fix everything. And no, you just end up with angry employees and bad attrition rates. Um, uh, regards to getting the business involved, one of the most powerful things I've ever had happen to me is that my last job, I was working at a bank and I worked in the department that did development for the call center technology. So your desktop app, the IBR, that sort of stuff. And 
we invited the head of, I guess he was like the COO at the time, I guess, or, or he was the COO of operations. Ever He was a mucky muck, right? He came and he sat and he watched a bunch of the stand-ups and he watched some of the demos go. And his remark to me was that it was me and a couple of his product owners. It was very powerful. He said, so, so really like I get to tell you what's most important for my business unit and then you have to do it. And I went, yeah, pretty much. And he said, and if something changes, I can pull a plug on that and go to something else. And I went, yeah, that's exactly it. And you could see the gears turning in his head because like, like we talked about earlier, all he knew was IT is this giant black hole where I open the closet door, I shovel money into it, I shut the closet door. And then in a year, either a monster comes out or a half-baked monster <laughs> comes out that I want to use. So it's, uh, it was really powerful for him to get it, to say, oh, I can actually help now. Now, I, how many more product owners do you need? Who do you need from my side that's a subject matter expert that can help guide this along? It was, I can't say that will happen to everybody, but that was really, really wild. So same question, Georgie, but on the other side, have you seen um, or how have you gotten, you know, IT guys, there's this, everybody has this vision of an IT guy. And sadly, I think Silicon Valley has sort of ruined the stereotype, right? It's either these programmers, right? Who are these like deep bro frat guys? And I was a fraternity guy, so all you fraternity guy listeners, I'm not crap. Um, but they have that stereotype, right? Of all these bros that only want to, you know, drink beer or whatever. And then you have the other side of the stereotype, which is that that fast intro uh, introvert, right? Doesn't want to talk to anybody, just wants to put his head down and code. And the reality is really somewhere in the middle, right? It's a healthy mix. Um, have you ever seen any time where the IT almost has trouble getting the business involved? Because they're masters of their own domain or maybe psychologically they've convinced themselves that they know so much about what they're doing that I can't get these business people involved. They're never going to keep up. Have you seen that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I had one um, engagement where <coughs> the product owner didn't really believe that he was the product owner because his boss kept telling him he wasn't the pro product <sighs> owner. And uh, he got no time to come over and deal with anything. Um, and we sat down, myself, a couple of other agile coaches, uh, some people from business, some people from IT. And uh, they were like, well, you know, we, we need 100% access to the guy. We don't need 100% of his time. We just need to know that if we send him a question, he's going to be able to answer it timely. And the, the, the boss, he uh, he was the C grade boss as well, and uh, he he said to us uh, in that meeting that uh, we could collate all the questions the developers had throughout the day, and if we sent it to him by 5 p.m., then he would send us uh, answers by 10 a.m. the next day. And so all our programmers were like, "Oh, let's do that then." And <laughs> We tried explaining, well, what do you want us to do before we answer these questions then? Because it could be that we've got a question come up at 9 a.m. And that means it's going to be 25 hours before we hear a response. What do you expect that person to do in the meantime? I'll just let them start doing something else. Um, okay, yeah, we, we could let them start doing something else. And then you start explaining all the problems with that that person never got it and I, I didn't stay around in that organization much longer after that. That sounds like paying to play. That sounds like a solution pitched upon someone's natural proclivity to um, not only back to our initial topic, like not having the business involved, but uh, send me a list. I'll get back to you so I can do it at my own pace. And then people who not necessarily may want to talk one-on-one -on -one will say, Oh, okay, well, there, I'll just fire all my 8,000 questions over. But then you have this person who, well, if you just, the timing alone, when you said, if you get the, get me the questions by five, I'll have you an answer by 10. That would assume that I'm either working overnight through the night, because Lord knows that every engineer I've worked with, any engineer worth their weight in salary is going to have a bazillion questions all the time. They're always asking questions, but, or that assumes that they come in the next morning at 8 a.m., and they have a completely free two hours every morning, which is <laughs> which is crazy to think that they yeah. can just answer questions. And, and then yeah. even on the, the lag and lead time, right? So I can ask you a question yesterday, maybe I can answer today, maybe I can answer tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's and crazy. not only that, you've also got so much potential for misunderstanding. 
really when a developer is producing a bit of software, what you need is the other person, the person who's going to use it or the, whoever the key stakeholder is, to come and stand next to the computer and feel what it's like to use it. Because software is, it, it taps right into those emotional centers of our brains. And we know this because we're talking about it lots at the moment. What's our problem with social media? Are our phones making our attention span short? Yes. <laughs> Should we let our children use technology? All of these questions. So this, this isn't even something that's just in IT. Everybody, this is mainstream discussion. Software equals feelings. And so if you really have a question and you want good quality answers, it needs to be a face-to-face -face conversation. Now, admittedly, that could be over a video chat, much like you and I are doing across the pond at the moment. Screen sharing technology and video conferencing technology have come so far. I remember when I started my career, and that was just over a decade ago, it's not that long, we could never have thought of doing something like this and it being this smooth and this higher quality. Mm -hmm. And, but now we can. So we just need to get people talking more. Uh, <laughs> this comes back to uh, management needs need to learn that their job is not about finding the solution to the problem that people have brought them, but finding a way to help those people come up with their solutions. So the, the managers need to be better at holding processes and holding spaces so that the people who are, are using those processes and spaces can interact better together. And sometimes that will just go down, sometimes it will go up, sometimes it will go diagonally around an organisation. But <laughs> you, you, you need to hold these flows of communication. And whenever I see problems in an organisation, I, I look for where are people not talking because that inevitably leads to the problem. It's the two, right? Follow the money and then follow the silence. That's, uh, there's no better way to end than with that. Um, I'm actually, I'm actually gonna, you gotta trademark that because that's gonna go on a t-shirt somewhere at some conference. Um, George, I wanna be, I wanna be, I wanna be um, careful with your time. I don't wanna take too much time. So do you have any, uh, to wrap us up, do you have any upcoming uh, appearances, conferences, speaking engagements? Where can, where can our listeners find you if they wanna know more? I believe you actually have a, um, uh, an email distribution that comes out. Uh, where can our where can our listeners find you if they want to learn or learn or, or find out more? Sure. So uh, I have my website georginahughes.com. Uh, that has some interesting blog posts, um, my coaching stance, so you can see where I believe I should be holding myself as a coach and how I hold myself accountable. Uh, and there's also the sign up there to my newsletter, which is really more of a self coaching experience. So some quotes, some questions to ask yourself, some images to challenge yourself around metaphor work. And I tackle a little bit about anxiety problems each month as well. So uh, that's quite an interesting one. Uh, I tweet at Agile George. And uh, in May, I think it is, I'm going to be appearing at Agile Manchester, which is a conference in the northwest of England. Um, I'm going to be doing a tutorial on creating engaging retros. Retrospectives are absolutely my passion. Uh, I, I love Esther Darby's book, Agile Retrospectives, and uh, Lisa Adkins has some fantastic things to say about retrospectives as well so i'm essentially taking all of their learning and teaching other people at this conference how to experience it i have a discount code which i'll share with you and you can put in the show notes for you perfect great great thank you so uh georgie on behalf of the agile uprising i'd like to sincerely thank you for taking your time uh spending it on this dreary sunday morning in the states um <laughs> And on behalf of uh, all of uh, George and myself, I'd like to thank all of your listeners for tuning in. Once again, if you enjoyed the episode, please give us a review or rating, leave a comment. iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Podbean, you name it, or you, any podcasting platform of choice, it does help others find us. If this is your first time listening, why not subscribe and get, a, get our updates every week? There will be a thread 
about this topic on coalition.agileuprice.com. So we invite all of our listeners to join in, uh, offer some feedback, offer some more questions. Um, Georgie is active. I do see her on the coalition. So uh, chances that you are, your questions will be noticed. And lastly, if you are interested, we do have a Patreon set up for those that like to help defray the cost of hosting and production. You can see our show notes for details on how to become a patron. Georgie, once again, thank you. And until next time, this is the Agile Uprising Podcast signing out.